So it's been a little while since we've gotten together, um, which uh, given the material that we talked about last time, I actually think that's kind of a good thing. I think um, what I wanted is to let some of that stuff seep in. And if the last lecture we had was all theory and, 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 and differential equations and all that, tonight is going to be more about applying a lot of that stuff. And we might not even apply some of the straight Diffie Q stuff tonight, um, but the big thing that I want to focus on tonight is just the, the, the straight calculations required to check a bridge. Um, and we'll probably be doing this not just tonight, but next week as well. But before we get into that, I want to do a little bit of, uh, of housekeeping. So just to make sure everybody's uh, on point and everybody remembers what's going on. So first off, um, hopefully everybody remembers that on November 15th you have your research presentations. Now I know that that's not anytime soon. I know you're thinking, well, it's October 18th and this says November 15th. So I guess we'll start on this on November 14th. That's a joke, not a very funny one. Um, no, in all seriousness, I know it's a little bit of ways away, but I did want to um, make sure everybody's got that still on the brain. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that? Remember, we're shooting for about uh, 10 minutes a, po uh, a person, and then if we end early, we end early, and we'll just call it. Okay, sound good? Okay. Um, now, I did not get your homework graded, the one you turned in, but I did get your exam graded. So um, I figured uh, if I'm going to grade something, what would you all be most interested in? You'd all be most interested in your exam. So let's go ahead and get the exam graded. And all in all, I think the exams went fairly well. I mean, there were some, some of the calculations uh, in part two. There were some numbers from some of you that I'll, I'll be honest, I wasn't 100% where a lot of it came from. But all in all, I think you all demonstrated to me that you know what you're doing and that um, you understand what's going on. So I'm going to go through the, uh, the solution to the exam, and I'll give everybody their exam back. Uh, let me, let, so let, let's go and do that now. So um, let's see, where am I going? Exam. Okay. So um, let me go ahead and start to pass the exams back out. Um, so let's see. Mr. Arola, I've got this for you as well because I know you had asked for it. We can talk a little bit about that afterwards. All right, Mr. Hatfield, and Mrs. Hatfield. Here we go. Vickis, Mr. Patel. Here we go. There we go. Shushmita, she's not here. Mr. Varanasi. Okay, I printed it off. I'm sorry it came out like that. Is that all right? All right. Uh, he said he wasn't going to be here tonight. Gautham. There we go. And Rahul. There we go. All right. Um, so let, we'll take our time and sort of go through this. Um, I'm not going to be uh, too overly detailed on part one, but I do want to at least do, be a little surgical with part two. Um, okay, so um, so part one, you had all your conceptual questions. Let me sort of take my time and go through these. So part one, describe the purposes behind the following limit states. I don't really think I counted any anything off on anybody because, I mean, there was literally a couple slides in the PowerPoints that it was just, I mean, I think most people saw it, and for the most part, they just sort of copied that down. That sort of in a way what I was intending. I just wanted to make sure that you were going through the notes uh, and whatnot. All right, number two, what are the key differences between allowable stress and LRFD? There's probably about 50 or 60 ways you could have answered this, but really the main thing I was looking for was that allowable stress design just straight uses factors of safety, whereas uh, LRFD does a little bit of a better job taking into account uncertainties associated with design. You know, the fact that you have live load factors that are higher than dead load factors and, 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 and other ish, uh, uh, facets of that. I think a lot of you said something that was fairly close or somewhat on that side, you know, that we were good there. Okay, why do we need section properties for steel plus longitudinal reinforcement and negative bending? The real answer is the concrete. You know, in negative bending, the concrete is in tension, okay? And concrete in tension isn't as effective. 
So there is some answers that maybe kind of alluded to that or um, uh, maybe didn't quite spell that out. That's really what I was looking for was that concrete, uh, the, the concrete intention, the fact that it's ineffective there. All right, number four, uh, I think just about everybody got this right, um, but uh, why is the dead load broken up into two components? Well, some is applied before the concrete debt becomes composite, some is applied after. Okay. Number five, uh, what's the purpose of multi-presence factors? Multi-presence factors account for coincident truck loadings on the bridge. And this was sort of a right or wrong kind of answer. I mean, the, most folks uh, got it right, but I think there was a couple that were iffy. Um, number six, I think, was the one that maybe people missed the most. Um, for what purpose do we employ a double truck live load model? And the big answer is negative bending. The double truck is intended to ensure that we're getting the worst case negative bending uh, across the pier. So if you had the words negative bending or pier in your answer, you probably got it correct. But if you didn't and didn't uh, mention that at all, you're probably missing some points. Okay. Number seven, how does girder spacing affect live load distribution? This was probably the second most uh, missed answer. And I, I was really looking for a specific answer. Now, you could have answered this two ways. You could have looked at it from an equation standpoint or looked at it from the physics. Okay? The question's asking, how does girder spacing affect live load distribution? And the answer is, the farther apart your beams are, the more load goes to a beam. Now, you can look at the equations and see, well, as S gets larger, the distribution factor gets larger, or you can just look at it from the physics standpoint. The farther apart beams are, the more load a particular beam is responsible for. So how does girder spacing affect live load distribution? As girder spacing goes up, live load distribution factors go up. And that was basically what I was looking for. Um, number eight, why do we divide by 1.2 when we're determining fatigue? Fatigue is calibrated according to a single truck. So we're dividing out 1.2 because that's the multi-presence factor for uh, single lane loaded scenarios. Everybody good? All right, um, now this one, uh, I think uh, just about everybody uh, did right by, by paying attention that it, uh, the question was asking for properties for a typical interior girder, so none of that special analysis or, or, or whatnot. There were a few folks who did lever rule calculations, but you didn't really use them, so I didn't really take off. Now I'll admit there is one quantity I forgot, that's I forgot to define the slab for you, the slab thickness. So basically what I did is I just gave everybody the benefit of the doubt and whatever value you assumed for that, you got, that was, the, you were right. Um, <coughs> but I did sort of take off if you didn't um, check this or, or didn't go by this stuff. Now there is one thing I'm going to, uh, to, to uh, mention, and I, I didn't count off for this, but there's a lot of people who didn't recognize this. And I want to go back to fundamentals. A W24 by 68, okay? What does the 24 mean? It's, what's the 24 mean? What's that? That's about how deep it is, right? Now, what does the 68 mean? Pounds per foot. A lot of folks on, when they were doing DC1 calcs, went through and like calculated the area and divided by 144 and multiplied by 0.49. Here we go. It's a W24 by 68. It weighs 68 pounds per foot, and that's it. There's, there's really no math there, and I was curious to see if anybody caught that. All right. For miscellaneous details, you just assume some percentage. I saw fives. I saw tens. I think I saw some folks do seven. It, it doesn't really matter just as long as you uh, stated your assumption. That's really what, what I was after there. Okay. Now, SIP forms, um, one thing that did sort of get me a little bit is any time that you're using quantities in the steel manual, you use the decimal values, the design values, not the detailing dimensions, and a lot of folks were using the 9, which maybe isn't as big of a deal here, but can be a big deal later when you're looking at flange thicknesses uh, and whatnot. So the flange width in this case is 8.97 inches or .748 feet. Now the pressure load is 15 pounds per square foot and your girder spacing is 8 feet. So remember if you've got a beam uh, or two beams that are spaced at 8 feet, you come in half a flange width, come in half a flange width. So that width uh, between girders is 8 foot minus uh, a flange width. 
Now there's a total of six girders, so we've got to multiply those times five spaces and divide by six girders. Plug and chug and you get about 0 .091 tips per foot. Now, <coughs> this one had a, a fair amount uh, of mistakes. Remember, this, what we're computing here is the haunch fillet. It's that little strip of concrete above the top flange. Now remember, the haunch is two inches, but how thick is that fillet of concrete? It's two inches minus the flange thickness, and the flange thickness is 0.585, and a lot of people left that off. Now the width is how wide that strip of concrete is, and it's 8.97 inches because that's how wide the flange is. Okay? And again, all those dimensions came from the tables that came at the end of the exam. All right? So here's the area of that strip of concrete. Multiply it by 0.15 tips per cubic foot and do a unit conversion on those inches, and there you go, 0 0.013. I mean, if you look at your values, and if you're getting that, that little strip of concrete weighs you know, 300 pounds per foot, something should be wrong. You, you, you see what I mean? That, that makes sense? Make sure you're, you've got the gravity of the situation uh, and the gravity of the calcs in your head. Okay. <laughs> now the slab, I assumed uh, eight and a half inches with a half inch integral wearing surface. So the total, so, so let's make sure we understand the dimensions here. We're calculating the area of the deck. The total width of that deck is 46 and a half feet. And a lot of people had 35 feet because they were using the span length. Now we're looking at the total cross-sectional width, you know, cutting a section through the bridge. So the total width is 46.5 feet. Here's the thickness using the total thickness, incorporating that integral wearing surface. Plug and chug and you get 0.823 kips per foot. So summarizing, these are the five component components. Keep in mind there's no taper, all right? VC1 comes out to be just shy of one kip per foot, all right? And that's that. DC2, each barrier weighs 0.5 kips per foot. There's two of them split over six girders. There you go, 0.167 kips per foot. All right, make sense? All right. All right, DW loads. DWs uh, are the wearing surface are applied over the total roadway width, which is 44 feet, okay? So 0.25 kips per square foot, which is the same thing as 25 pounds per square foot, over a width of 44 feet divided by six girders, and there you go, 0.183 kips per foot. All right, next live loads. We need to do a longitudinal stiffness parameter. Again, you didn't need to compute the area. You didn't need to compute the moment of inertia. It was given to you in the table. It's just 1830 and, and uh, what, 20.1. Now the centroid, because it's doubly symmetric, is just half the depth. So if this is the depth, half that's 11.85. That's where the centroid is. So you didn't even need to go through and do all the tabular calcs and everything. You could do all this by hand. Now EG is the distance from the center of the beam to the center of the deck. So going from the very bottom and working my way up, D will get me from the bottom of the beam all the way to the very top. I gotta subtract out that flange thickness and then jump up two inches for my haunch. Jump up half a slab thickness and that's from the very bottom of the section all the way to the center of the slab. And then come up Y bar and that's my moment arm. So plug and chug and that comes out to be about 17.27 inches plug and chug for kg and it comes out to about 62,500 and something. Okay? Make sense? All right. Plug and chug. Again, S is the girder spacing. It's 8 feet. L is the span length, 35 feet. T sub S is the slab thickness, which is whatever you assume, and kg is 62,500. So plug and chug for each of your four interior girder distribution factors. Here's moment for one lane loaded, comes out to about 0.514. Here's moment for two lane loaded, comes out to about 0.668. Shear for one lane loaded and two lane loaded come out as 0.68 and 0.814 respectively. Now, the last one that needed to be computed was the distribution factor for deflection, okay? This bridge carries three lanes of traffic, okay? Because the total width, remember, how do you determine that? You take that, that total roadway width and you divide by 12. Okay, the roadway width is what, 44? 
So if you take 44 and divide by 12, what do you get? What, three, three and change, right? Remember, you take the floor, so there's three lanes. So three lanes over six girders times the appropriate multi-presence factor, which for three lanes is 0.85. There's your distribution factor for deflection. So to summarize, that's part two. These are the answers to part two right here. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? All, right. all in all, I, I was pretty pleased. I think y'all did very well. So, everybody good? Okay. All right. We do have one final, I guess, item of, of housekeeping, and that's going back to the syllabus. There is something that was kind of left off. Let's see. So here's the syllabus, and here's the... Uh, the grade for the class. See anything we haven't really talked about yet? We have a design project in this class. <laughs> All right. So let's talk a little bit about that design project. All right. So here's how this is going to work. Uh, I'm going to take my time with it and make sure everybody understands what's going on with it. Okay. So your design project is going to be done individually. Okay, so each one of you is going to be responsible for all the aspects of this design. Okay, so I've got my senior design folks. Their design project is ramped up a little bit, but they're in a team. You all are grad students, so you get to do this one by one. Okay, so you're going to be designing a typical interior composite steel plate girder according to the following specs. Okay, so you're going to use 50 KSI steel throughout. The girder does not need to be symmetric. So you can have a bigger top flange than bottom flange or whatever, what have you. Usually your bottom flange is bigger, but there you go. Assume four KSI concrete throughout. Uh, assume that the deck is 8.25 inches thick with a quarter inch integral wearing surface. Now I've given you uh, uh, assuming uh, 7 8 inch diameter A108 studs with an uh, ultimate tensile strength of 65 KSI. That doesn't mean a whole lot now. It will later uh, when we do stud design. Design your girder employing your random L and LB, as you'll see here in a second. All right. Assume the following load components. Uh, employ a 10-foot wide girder spacing, a 2-inch thick haunch, and a 3-foot wide overhang. Everybody okay with this? Okay. Now, you're going to be submitting your project um, at 5 p.m. on the last day of the semester. Okay. So on December 9th. So, uh, oh, actually, uh, yeah. So we'll meet that Tuesday. You'll submit that Friday, and we won't meet for final exam week because I'll probably just give you a, a, a very short and brief take home. So something like this one, but actually it'll probably be shorter. So um, <coughs> when you submit it, make sure you can submit all your calculations as well as, as a sketch of your girder. Okay? Make sure you're telling me what the girder looks like in some reasonable fashion. I want you to design your girder according to cross-section proportion limits, a constructability check. For the constructability check, we're going to assume the deck is one continuous pour since we're looking at a short span bridge. Uh, the service limit state, which we're actually going to cover a lot of this stuff tonight. Okay? And a lot of uh, some of this other stuff like fatigue and, and, and whatnot, we'll get to this throughout the, uh, um, throughout the, the next couple weeks. Uh, fatigue. Uh, you're going to have to pick certain details for fatigue, so you're going to assess the cross-frame connection closest to mid-span, basically that bottom tension flange region, and you're also going to have to assess fatigue for the studs. Fatigue is what's going to govern your stud layout, but we'll get to that later on. And obviously your strength limit state, we're going to assess uh, flexor, shear, and if necessary you'll have to put, lay out any stiffeners uh, and what have you, but that's simple. A ductility check, which takes about 2.6 seconds to do. And don't worry about bearing stiffeners uh, sizing. Don't worry about bearing sizing or actually sizing the cross frames. I'm more interested in the girders. Everybody good? Any questions so far? Okay. Now, let me show you how this is going to work. And I've prepared this, which might um, make this a little simpler. A lot of this stuff, I'll go ahead and prepare you. I haven't uploaded yet to MU Online, but I will. Okay. Now let me get into the dead loads. Now these are all simply supported beams. Okay? So you all should be able to draw the shear and moment diagram for a simply supported beam, right? But you know, even so, not, not that big of a deal. I'm assuming you all can set this up pretty easily. 
So I've set up the following two spreadsheets for you. So this spreadsheet will compute your shears and moments according to however long your beam is and whatever your DC1, DC2, and DW is. So for instance, if I say, you know what, this beam is in fact uh, 80 foot long, it changes all the, the moments and shears. If my DC1 is instead, no, 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 that's 1.35, there you go, your DC1 values change. Make sense? So you can just input that and it'll just update it for you pretty easily. The point is, is that you all can build this massive spreadsheet. I mean, I mean, let's think about this in terms of design. If I change a flange dimension, right, that'll change your moments of inertia, but your spreadsheet should be able to just take care of that. It'll change your DC1 and DC2 and DW load, but your spreadsheet should be able to just take care of that, right? So if you all spend some time in Excel, you can have Excel do a lot of these automated counts for you, and that's perfectly fine. That's kind of the point, okay? Make sense? All right, so here's the, uh, the dead load uh, calculations. Now for the live loads, um, since everything is simply supported, a lot of this stuff doesn't change. So in the background of this spreadsheet, there's what I did is I ran uh, that program Leap Consist I showed you. I ran that thing for just about every different span length iteration that you would need. So for instance, if you change the span length from 75 foot to let's say 80 foot, it changes all of your moments and shears accordingly. Now for this, you're also going to need the uh, uh, short-term composite moment of inertia because if I change that, what that'll do is change the, uh, the deflections down here as well. Okay? I'm not expecting you to sit here and go through influence line analysis over and over and over again. I'm assuming that you all already understand that. You all have a bachelor's degree in engineering, so you've seen this stuff before. I'm not expecting you to be able to uh, replicate it because you've already done it. All right. <laughs> what I want you to be able to do is take this information and manipulate it accordingly. Make sense? Okay. Now, let's look at this. So what I've done is I have laid out 12 different bridges. Okay. They have varying span lengths and varying cross frame spacings. So to give you kind of an idea, what will probably happen when this is all said and done, like for instance, let's take a look at bridges two and three. Bridges two and three are the same length, but the cross frame spacing is wider. So what's probably going to happen is I'm going to get a bigger beam out of um, uh, whoever designs bridge number two as opposed to whoever designs bridge number three. Now since everything's simply supported, don't think that the, the project gets more difficult and whatnot if the bridge gets longer. I mean. Honestly, the amount of computations required for bridge number 12 is the same as bridge number 1. It's a non-issue. Okay? Make sense? All right. So I have here a series of notepads or notes that have numbers 1 through 12 on it. So, okay, they kind of stuck together a little bit, so let's break those up. I thought that would be much more dramatic, but it was just kind of this one big chunk that just sort of, you know, went back and forth. Okay, that's a little better. All right. So I'm going to need to keep track of who got what. So um, you pick one. All right. You can do two bridges if you want. <laughs> Actually, you're, you're exactly right. Getting your Excel sheet set up right, it wouldn't matter. Okay. All right. So today is the 18th of October. All right. So I'm going to still do the sign-in sheet. But I'm going to call your names. Tell me what number you got. So, Mr. Arola? 11. Okay. Mr. Hatfield? 8. Mrs. Hatfield? 12. Okay. Jehu? 6. Vix? 4. Mr. Patel? 5. 
page nine. Okay, she's not here. It's Varanasi. Three. All right, uh, Mr. Reddy's not here, or Mr. Yakawari. Seven. Lucky number seven. And Rahul. Ten. So that means we've got one and two. How did that happen? How did that even happen? That's amazing. What's that? Problem stats question. Somebody tell me the probability that one and two were left over. Permutations and combinations. Remember, remember all that stuff? All right, I'm picking four of these two. All right, so the first one is two. Okay. So. All right. Okay. So now I'm going to pass the sign-in sheet around. I do need that back, by the way. <laughs> okay. So there's that. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So does everybody understand what's going on with the project? Does anybody have any questions? Everybody good? Okay. Now, what we're going to be beginning to do tonight, and, and I want to try and get through as much of it as I can in as uh, rapid succession as I can, but I don't want to rush it. Um, but what I want to do tonight is start to go into 610 and actually do some of these, these checks. Okay? So let's go back a little bit to what we were talking about last time with our, uh, with our uh, design calculations. So let me go up into the notes. Okay, <clears throat> so we were talking last time about Article 610, and I gave you all a copy of that article, right? So you all have the, the whole kit and caboodle, or, or at least a fair chunk of it, am I correct? Okay, um, we talked about um, a lot of this stuff, and, and I've got some of the stuff highlighted blue and some of the stuff highlighted red. The blue stuff is stuff that we will come back to, but the red stuff, I, wa I want to kind of... I want to hit that up, uh, you know, in quick succession, or at least as quickly as possible. Okay, so um, we've got here, for instance, uh, a series of sections, and we're going to take these one at a time. Okay, now 6101, there aren't any, really any design checks in there. That was just all the general stuff, like how you calculate stresses, short term, long term, how, where's the definition for a hybrid factor. Uh, and, and all that other, you know, just general stuff. There's no real checks, okay? Let's start getting into this. Uh, 6102, cross-section proportion limits, okay? Now, if you recall, cross-section proportion limits are, are really intended to ensure that you as the engineer are developing and creating a girder that meets the specifications and that behaves properly. You know, when these folks get together and they write all these fancy equations that you can use to predict how strong a beam is. They're writing those equations based on certain, you know, constraints to, to a given beam. In other words, it's got to look like an eye beam. It's got to have certain flange proportions and certain web proportions that fit within the body of the spec. Now, you're sitting here and you're designing bridge number seven and you've got this span length and this cross ring spacing, right? And you're sitting here and, and you're playing around with all the flange properties and the web depths and all this stuff to try and get a beam that makes sense. But in the end, not only do you have to have a beam that's strong enough, but keep in mind you are determining that that beam is strong enough based on the spec. If that beam doesn't fall within the limits of the spec, then all those calculations you did was a waste of time. Make sense? So the purpose of 6102 is to ensure that your beam fits within the, that set of specs. Make sense? All right, so let me go to the spec and just sort of really quickly go back through some of this stuff and make sure everybody's all right with it. All right. Ashtow bridge cover. Okay. Let's see. can't believe I got that close. Well, let me scroll up and find it. Of course, the bridge spec had to be massive. Uh, 
There we go. Okay. So cross-section proportion limits, I'm on page 6-120. So everybody should have that uh, uh, component of the spec, right? Am I right on that? All right. While you're turning to that, let me sort of go through this. So 610-2 is broken up into two sections, uh, 610-2-1, which is on web proportions, and 610-2-2, which is on flange proportions. Okay. So let's just sort of read this out. 610-2 on web proportions. Uh, webs without longitudinal stiffeners. And remember, <coughs> we talked about longitudinal stiffeners, or if you have an I-beam and you have a really, really you know, flimsy, slender web that you will weld an additional plate along the length of that weld to stiffen it, and we call that a longitudinal stiffener. Um, sometimes we can't get around that. Sometimes you have just this massively deep section and you got to throw a longitudinal stiffener in there to ensure that the girder is going to make sense. But when possible, don't put longitudinal stiffeners on there. It's another plate that needs to be cut and needs to be welded. It's just going to add increased costs. If you can avoid it, don't do it. And for most, you know, uh, you know, reasonable length bridges, anything under, I mean, I, I'd say anything under 200 feet, you should never need to do something like that. Okay? Especially, I mean, when it comes to, to your design project, if you're putting a longitudinal stiffener on there, you're doing something wrong. Okay? Make sense? All right. So if you have a web without a longitudinal stiffener, you should proportion that web such that the web slenderness, and that's this D over TW, we're talking about how slender the web is, is less than 150. Now keep in mind your units, you're taking D over TW, so the units should cancel out. Make sense? So if I go through and, go and determine these, uh, these proportion limits, I might have something that looks like this. And you're like, we don't have that. You do now because I'm handing it out. So here's that. Here's that. Here's that. And here's that. Oh, sorry. Everybody sign this? Okay. All righty. Okay. So I want to go back to the example that we've been looking at this entire semester, that two-span uh, composite plate girder bridge. Everybody remember that? I got a positive bending region, negative bending region. It should be the, a fairly familiar structure. Now we're going to consider the positive bending region. Keep in mind your beam looks something like this. The top flange is 14 inches wide and it's 3 quarter inches thick. The web is 42 inches deep and it's 7 16 inches thick. The bottom flange 16 by 1 and a quarter. Sound good? So let's go through these one at a time. First off, the web proportions, D over TW. So that's the slenderness of this web, 42 divided by 7 16. Do the math and you're going to get 96. Is that good? Pretty straightforward, right? So 96 is less than 150, we're good. That web meets appropriate slenderness limits. Any questions? Okay. <coughs> All right, flange proportions. Okay. Let's go to the spec because I want to go back and forth and make sure that we're seeing where this stuff's coming from. So I'm going down. Now notice all this stuff here on the right is the commentary. So if you want to know where this is coming from, there you go. Okay. So now I'm in flange proportions. Okay. Compression flanges and tension flanges shall be proportioned such that the following limits are met. So the first one, DF over 2TF has to be less than or equal to 12. So that's just a general flange slenderness limit. And the main proportion or the main reason behind this proportion is so that if your flange gets too flimsy, you, you know, think about what happens. If your flange gets too flimsy and you start taking a, a MIG welder and start welding that flange to that web, you're going to get a lot of warping and distortion in that flange. I mean, think what happens when you weld. You're putting a lot of heat, heat input to melt these steel components together. So you've got to have a, a stocky enough flange that can take that. All right. So BF over 2TF, pretty straightforward calc. So don't need that. 
BF over 2TF. So what I'm doing is I'm doing BF over 2TF for the top flange, BF over 2TF for the bottom flange. So for the top flange, 14 over 2 times 3 quarters, plug and chug, and that comes out to be 9.33. For the bottom, plug and chug comes out to be 6.4. Both of them are less than 12, so we're good, right? All right. Next one. <coughs> Next one states that the flange width, regardless whatever flange you're talking about, has to be greater than or equal to D over 6. And there's a, a fairly, you know, con, I don't want to say convoluted, but there's a fairly um, uh, involved reason, I would say, as to why that limit matters. And it's ba it basically has to do with moment rotation capacity. In other words, the, the relationship to how much moment, or rela the relationship of bleh, how much moment you apply versus how much the girder deforms. Okay? And you want girders to have a significant amount of ductility. And this comes from a whole bunch of uh, tests on, on I-beams that found that that ratio ensures good moment rotation behavior. So we just ensure that our beams meet this limit. So the flange width has to be greater than or equal to D over 6. So you can say, all right, D over 6 is 42 over 6, which is 7 inches. And both flanges are larger than that. Uh, this flange is 14 inches. This flange is set, uh, 16 inches. So we're good. Make sense? Okay. So next one, <coughs> you must have a, a, a relationship between your flange width and your web, uh, your flange thickness and your web thickness, such that your flange thickness is uh, greater than 1.1 uh, of your uh, web thickness. And again, it's another plug and chug. So 1.1 times the web thickness comes out to about 0.48 inches, and both of those are bigger. Sound good? Your last one states that, uh, let me go, oh, let me go here. Your last one states that the ratio of IYC over IYT has to be between 0.1 and 10. Now, let's start off, let me go back and explain again what that is, is intended to govern, okay? Remember, we're looking at I-beams, okay? Now, you as the engineer have the power to tailor those flange sizes and web sizes to whatever load demand you need, okay? Make sense? But it's possible that you could create a girder that doesn't really make much sense. Remember that T shape I showed you where you had a really big top flange but a really, really tiny bottom flange? That's not an I-beam. Even though you've got three plates there, it's not an I-beam. It's not going to behave like one. It's going to behave like a T-section. The Both of those flanges need to be comparable in size. Not saying they have to be equal, but their sizes have to be comparable. And the way that we govern that is we say that the ratio of these two moments of inertia has to be between uh, 0.1 and 10. Now the way that I sort of excelify this, which I'll talk about that here in a second, is this. Okay. I start off by computing the moment of inertia of each flange. Now I was talking about the moment of inertia this way. So we take the thickness times the width cubed over 12. So TB cubed over 12 for the top flange comes out to be about 171 inches to the fourth, and for the bottom flange comes out to be about 426. Now, the reason why it's stating that limit is between 0.1 and 10 is because the spec doesn't know if the top flange is in compression or if the bottom flange is in compression. Because it doesn't know when you're doing this calc if you're dealing with a positive bending region or a negative bending region. But an easy way to check this is just do this. Take the larger of the two over the smaller of the two and divide that out. And if that value is less than 10, then you're good. Okay? So you're doing essentially the same thing. And that's a, an Excel-friendly formula if I've ever seen one. Okay? Make sense? Now, the reason why I show you all this and go through these calcs, this is a very easy uh, set of calculations to Excelify. Okay? In other words, what might behoove you and what might be important is, you know, if I go back to this, let me pull this up. Okay, remember this? This was the series of section property calculations that we did. It might be a good idea to say, all right, based on this input, Let's do a bunch of calculations right here. Let's just check the cross-section proportion limits right now so that when I start playing around with 
and flange widths and web thicknesses and whatnot that I don't generate a girder that doesn't make any sense. And I could just do a set of calculations right here off the side and know that I've checked that. Make sense? So it's not that bad. It's just something that you need to do. Okay? Anybody have any questions on that? This is, I just want to make sure this makes sense. Are I good? Okay. All right. Now, service limit state. Okay. Live load deflections, I I'll handle that later. It's really a, there's not a whole lot to say about it. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, but the permanent deformations, that is, uh, that takes a little bit of discussion. Uh, it is very easy to set up in Excel, but you've got to be a little careful about it. Um, let me go back a little bit further in time and, and go through some notes with you that might seem some maybe familiar, maybe not, maybe it's been a while, no big deal. I want to look at this. Okay. Do you remember when we went through this and started to look at the, the probabilities associated with ASD versus LRFD? And then we took a fair amount of time and actually started to dig into the specifications. And we said, all right, let's go into the, uh, the limit states and let's go into the load combos. Y'all remember this? And then we said, all right, let's eliminate all the stuff that you know, we don't care about and focus only on the limit states associated with steel bridges, and we came up with this slide. Well, this slide and this one, right? I remember I said when we start doing load combos, I said you probably want to put a star on this slide because this is a slide we really are going to want to care about. Remember that? Well, we're going to go back to this now because we're doing a service limit state check. We probably need to look at the service limit state. Now, if you look at the service limit state, there's only one load combination that we really care about, and that's service two. If you remember, service three and service four are related to concrete, and particularly post-tension limits and whatnot. Service one is your live load deflection. Service two, that's the one that's trying to control yielding and steel bridges. That's the one that's important to us right now. And after going through all the, the spec and trying to simplify it, we got that the load combo is 1 times DC plus 1 times DW plus 1.3 times your live load. Been a while, but remember that? Okay. All right. Well, if you remember that and then you remember your bending stress formula, right? Remember sigma equals MY over I or maximum stress is M over your section modulus. If you remember that, then you'll see that what I've got here should make relative sense. So if I'm trying to determine flange stresses in the positive bending region, it's just moment over section modulus, moment over section modulus, the one that makes sense. Now for negative bending, I've got here, instead of long term and short term, I'm using steel plus longitudinal reinforcement, or steel plus steel reinforcement. Okay? Make sense? There is a reason why I'm doing that. And that'll become clear when we start to delve into these, uh, these calculations. Everybody good? All right. So let's take this one one at a time. We're going to do this one, and then we'll probably take a break because uh, this one's a little more involved. Okay. Let me hand this down. These guys, theirs. C2. There you go. Thank you. Okay. So let's take our time with this one one by one and make sure we understand what's going on. Now, the first thing I'm going to do before I do any of this stuff is I want to delve into the spec. Okay. So let's go into the spec. So we're looking at section 610.4. Okay. So if I go to section 610.4 in the spec, which you all have, should look something like this. Now, there's a 610.4.1 and a 610.4.2. The 610.4.1 is all related to your live load deflection check, L over 800. I'll tackle that later. All right, 610.4.2 for permanent deformations, okay? Now, 
These bullet points that you see right here, these bullet points that you see right here, we're going to handle those, okay? But we're going to take our time with them later. Suffice it to say that for right now, all this stuff is related to negative bending. And for right now, I'm going to do positive bending first, then I'm going to do negative bending, okay? Make sense? But we'll, we'll tackle those later. Okay. Now, our limits state that flanges shall satisfy the following requirements. What do we got? We got the top flange of composite sections, the bottom flange of composite sections, and both flanges of non-composite sections. All right, so let's test your memory. What's RH? What is that? What's this term right here? Anybody remember that? Go ahead. Remember the hybrid factor? Remember that hybrid girder factor? Remember if you have different grades of steel for the flanges than you do for the web? Remember that? That's that hybrid girder factor. For us, for this example, the hybrid girder factor is going to be 1 because everything's the same grade of steel. Okay? Speaking of, what is the yield stress for the steel? Anybody remember? Remember when we did our MP calcs and our MY calcs, we needed the yield stress? Anybody remember what that was? Fifty KSI. There we go. Everybody remember that? Awesome. All right. So if you notice, we're looking at a composite girder. Both of these sections, the capacity, which is over here on this side, this is how much the flange can withstand. 0.95 times RH times our yield stress. So for both of these flanges, regardless of which one we're looking at, I have, you know, a top flange and bottom flange limited by this stress. For both of them, RH is the hybrid girder factor. That's one. My flange stress is 50 KSI. So here's my limit. 0.95 times 1 times 50. All right. Sound good? Any questions so far? Now, you all are engineers, so I want you to understand the equations. Okay? All right. Let's look at these two equations. What's the difference in the equation from the top flange to the bottom flange? What's the difference? Plus F sub L, right? So we got this term here, F sub L. Now, if you recall, F sub L last time is that term known as lateral flange bending. In other words, uh, if you've got a, a concrete deck overhang or something like that, that's how much twisting you get in that flange. Make sense? Y'all remember that? Now, first off, top flanges versus bottom flanges, why do we not consider that effect in the top flange? Well, it's because we're looking at composite sections. We assume that the top flange is fully braced by that concrete deck, and we don't have to, we don't care about it. Make sense? We only care about it in the bottom flange when the flange is out there all by its lonesome. Okay? That's when we care about that lateral effect. Now, for us, for this check, we're going to take FL to be zero for two reasons. Number one, we don't actually consider wind loads or concrete deck overhang loads at the service limit state. All we're caring about is its day in, day out condition. The only instance that we would get lateral stresses at the service limit state is if the girder was curved or if the girder had some weird geometry like major skew or major curvature. This is a straight regular girder. So in those instances, F sub L would be zero. Does that make sense? So we're not going to need to consider that. <coughs> Everybody good? All right. Okay. Now, let's talk about the moments. Okay. To compute flange stresses, we need moment over section modulus, right? Make sense? All right. So, I want to go back then to this. Y'all remember all these calculations? Remember the DC1, DC2, and the live load distribution? Remember all that? Okay. Now, I want to look at the magnitudes. Let me go over here. Now, if I just look at the dead load moments, notice how as you start going down the span. See how I've got the 0.4 highlighted? 
Notice how these are the largest positive moments that we're really seeing because, you know, we've got, what, 333, 561, 685, then we've got 702, then it starts to drop back down. See how that 0.4L, that's the maximum positive moments that we're seeing? So these are the moments that I'm going to use for the positive bending stresses, or for the, po yeah, the positive bending region. Okay, so these are the dead load moments. As for the live load moments, I'm going to use these ones all the way over here, okay? So remember we did the case one, case two, case three, case four, did all that, and then we got this. Remember that? Everybody okay with that? So what do we have? We've got, let's re read our values off. I got what, like 702.74, I got a 146.08, uh, 119.39, and then since my live load is a range, and I'm looking at positive bending, I might as well just use that one, the 1661. That's going to generate the largest stresses. So everybody see then where I'm getting these numbers? The, there's the DC1, DC2, DW, and the live load moment. I'm taking the positive value because I'm looking at positive bending. That's the worst case scenario. These are all in foot kips. Right off the bat, I'm going to go ahead and just convert them to inch kips and multiply everything by 12. Okay? Simple enough, right? Sound good? All right. Okay. Now, section properties for the positive bending region. Okay? Now, if you recall, remember, when we're looking at interior girders versus exterior girders, the exterior girder was the worst case scenario, right? Remember, it had the larger distribution factors. And then the section properties were smaller. So if I'm going to check one, might as well check the exterior girder. Make sense? So if I look at the top flange versus the bottom flange, let's go back to, to the beginning. So here's the, remember this? These were the section properties for that girder. So what do we got? For the steel section by itself, what's the section modulus? 614.01, right? What's the short-term composite section modulus? Well, if I look at, let's see, an exterior girder, look at the top of the section, I get one or 10,008.17, right? Long-term composite, exterior, top of steel, I get this. Make sense? Okay. And as for the bottom of steel, I'd get, you know, long-term composite 1159.78, short-term composite 1247.17 uh, and then that 887.49. So you're seeing where I got those numbers. Well, if you understand where I got the moments and understand where I got the section moduli, it's just M over S. So your service two stresses, here's my load combination, one times DC plus one times DW plus 1.3 times live load, plug and chug. All right. So here's the flange stresses for the top flange. I'm taking my DC1 over non-composite, DC2 and DW over long-term composite, uh, live load over short-term composite. Take each of them, plug and chug, and I get about 17.5 KSI. Make sense? Same thing for the bottom flange. Go through, plug and chug, go through, plug and chug, and I get 33.0 something KSI. Sound good? And keep in mind, we didn't, we didn't care at all about lateral flange bending. It didn't matter to us because the bridge isn't curved, it isn't skewed, and we're not considering wind and construction loads at all at the service two limit state. I'm not saying we don't consider them, they're just not at the service limit state. That's more of a strength check, okay? That's where we're factoring the loads and doing all that. Make sense? Everybody good? Okay. All right, so if I summarize the positive bending region, let's take a look at this. Okay, so for the top flange, here was the stress, here's the capacity. Would that be good? That's a good result, right? This is how much we're actually putting on the girder, and this is how much it can withstand. That's good, right? Okay, now we bridge engineers, we like to express that through what's called a performance ratio. We just take this and divide it by that. If you take this and divide it by that, you'll get a ratio of 0 .368. 0 .368 is a measure 
of the performance of that flange other, under that limit state. Now, if I was a, a good bridge engineer, I would want all those numbers, all those performance ratios to come out to be like 0.999, you know? Because that would be so close to capacity, but not going over, right? Problem is that'll never happen, okay? There, it's, it's impossible to design a girder to where all the ratios are 0.999. It is very possible to get one of them to be 0.999, but the others might not, uh, might not fall that way. But in the end, that doesn't matter. If your governing performance ratio is 0.999, then you've got a good design. Okay? In, in my book, if you're doing, the, you know, in terms of actually practically designing a girder, if you're getting a girder in the 0 0.9, 0 0.95 range, you're doing all right. Okay? Make sense? And that's very possible. It's also very possible on your project. Your worst case performance ratio, you should be able to get it in that 0 0.9, 0 0.95 range. Very easily. Very easily. Make sense? Okay. Now that's the top flange. Or, or sorry, that's the, the positive bending region. And same thing here. If I take FF plus FL over 2 for the bottom flange, I can do the same story. All right. That's the positive bending region. Everybody good? Okay. Now, negative bending region. Before we talk about the negative bending region, remember I said I was going to go back to these bullet points? Remember that? Those bullet points? Let's read through those bullet points. Let, let's take our time with them. Okay. So the following methods may be used to calculate stresses in the steel at the service to limit state. Okay, let's look at the first bullet point. Four members with shear connectors provided throughout their entire length, okay, that also satisfy the provisions of Article 61017. If you go back to Article 61017, what that states is we have to provide some minimum amount of reinforcement, which we did, right? Remember we said we were going to put 1% of reinforcement in our section property, two-thirds in the top, one-third in the bottom? That came from that article, okay? So we've met that. And as for shear connectors, it's a composite bridge. We're going to put shear studs in there. So we've got that too. All right. If we've done all that, stresses in the steel uh, caused by service two loads applied to the composite section may be computed using short term and long term. Uh, however, we've got to look at this. The concrete deck may be assumed to be effective for both positive and negative flexure, provided that the maximum longitudinal tensile stresses in the deck caused by service two loads are smaller than this, where F sub R is the modulus of rupture. So what we've got to do is we've got to determine what are the stresses in the concrete deck. Everybody okay with this? All right. <coughs> so F sub R, modulus of rupture. And you folks who remember me from concrete design are going to get a, a little ticked off at me for what I'm about to do now. Okay, so let's go to 61017. Okay, so here's section 61017. Okay, now a lot of this stuff should be familiar. For instance, the required reinforcement should be placed in two layers uniformly distributed across the deck width, two thirds in the top layer. Y'all remember that, right? Okay, now normal weight concrete. We've got F sub R, which is what we're dealing with. We need to determine how to calculate F sub R. F sub R is 0.24 square root of F C prime. Now, you all who, ha who took me for reinforced concrete design probably remember me drilling into your heads. Anytime you see a square root of F C prime, what do you do? Say, say it louder. PSI. You put in PSI and you get out PSI, right? Not in the bridge spec. In the bridge spec, you put in KSI and you get out KSI. And, and the reason they did that is because all of the other limits and checks in the spec are written in terms of KSI. So they just sort of rewrote this uh, in that fashion. I mean, F sub R, if you remember from concrete design, we calculated it as like 7.5 times the square root of F C prime. The, the difference between the 7.5 and the 0.24 is factoring out that square root of a thousand, the PSI to KSI conversion. That's it. So, so yeah. Everybody okay with that? All right. So, 
Let's look at this. All right, negative bending region. So the first thing that I compute is that modulus of rupture, which if I'm dealing with four KSI concrete, this is where you put in KSI and you get out KSI. So that, the modulus of rupture is about 48 K, or 0.48 KSI. So two times that is 0.96. So if the stresses in our concrete deck are less than 0.96 KSI, we can use short term and long term, which is a good thing. If, if they are, then we want to use short term and long term. Short term and long term sections are stronger, which means the stresses are going to go down. We want to use them if we can. So let's see what happens. Now, <clears throat> if I look at the short-term composite section property, my centroid is about 39.01 inches from the top. Okay? Now, how do I get that? Uh, go here. There's my negative bending region. And I mean, if I'm looking at the short-term composite, it's basically this dimension right here, from the centroid to the way, way, way bottom, 39.01. Sound good? Okay. Now, the total depth of this entire section is 53.25 inches. And that's starting at the way bottom, going a bottom flange thickness, a web depth, a haunch, and 8 inches. Make sense? The reason why, if I'm going to do a sigma equals my over i, I need the i. I need the distance from the centroid to the way, way, way tippy top of the deck, right? So it's going to be that minus that, which is about 14 inches, all right? There's the moment of inertia. So this divided by that will give me the section modulus, and that's the section modulus for the deck, okay? Make sense? Remember originally I had top of steel, bottom of steel, then I had top of deck, and I just said, eh, we don't really need to worry about it. We can just do that for this check right here, okay? Long-term composite, it's a similar set of calcs. The total depth, there's the Y-bar. The Y-bar changes as well as the moment of inertia. Plug and chug, and I get a different section modulus. Sound good? Now, if I go through, well, before I calculate the stresses, I need the moments. So going back here, the worst case negative bending region is right there at the pier, right? right here, because these are the worst negative values. Now, I only care about magnitude, so I'm not going to incorporate the negative sign. It really doesn't matter. Um, but here's DC1, here's DC2, here's DW. And then just like before, I go all the way over here once I've distributed those live loads, and there's my live load. So here's my live load moment, and then those three over here are my dead load moments, which is exactly what I've got written there. Okay, make sense? Did y'all see where I got that? Okay. <coughs> so, I need to determine the stresses in the concrete deck. Notice how I didn't use DC1. Remember, DC1 is the load applied to the non-composite section. The concrete deck doesn't see those stresses at all, right? Because the concrete deck isn't there. Make sense? So I'm only calculating the stress in the deck due to DC2, DW, and the live load. Now, you'll notice here I'm dividing by N. Why am I dividing by N? Well, if you recall, how did we determine those moments of inertia to begin with? We took that piece of concrete and transformed it into an effective lump of steel, right? Well, when you do that and you look at the actual stresses, there's a jump right there, right there from the steel to the concrete. I actually just taught mechanics and materials this morning. We talked about this very topic today. Um, when you look at bending theory, right at that point, you assume that the strains are the same, but since your moduli of elasticity change, the stresses drop a little bit, and they drop by that modular ratio. That's why we use it, okay? So I'm doing M over S for this section, but I got to include that 1 over A. If I go through and plug and chug, I find that I get 1.39 KSI shucks. I wanted to use those uh, short-term and long-term sections, but I can't because those stresses are larger than two times the rupture strength of the concrete, okay? So in other words, the concrete's cracked, it's ineffective, and I got to use steel plus longitudinal reinforcement. Sucks, but got to do it. Sound good? So looking at exterior girder section properties, and this is the note where I'm talking about the sigma equals my over i, but with that 
uh, modular ratio. Looking at my section properties, I really only need a top and bottom flange section modules for the steel by itself and then the steel plus the steel reinforcement. Um, <coughs> again, using properties for the exterior girder. Same story. Calculate the flange stress uh, for the top flange and the flange stress for the bottom flange. And here's what I get. Anybody see a problem with that? Look at this number. If I go and summarize that out, what happened? If I look at the bottom flange, the bottom flange is carrying 48.9 KSI. That's more than it can handle. So this entire time, it looks like th for this entire semester, we've been using a bridge that's no good, you know, because it fails the service to check right there, okay? So at this point, this is an important you know, finding because you're going to encounter this stuff when you do your design project, okay? So let's think about this. Let's just have a thought experiment. How would you correct this situation? The, fl the bottom flange is seeing stresses that are too large. What would you do to that bottom flange? All right, let's just keep it as basic as could be. What's the simplest answer to that question? The bottom flange stresses are too large, so what do you do to that bottom flange? Make it bigger. Simple, right? Make it thicker, make it wider, make it bigger, right? Now there's a problem with that, okay? If you take the bottom flange and you make those stress, that bottom flange larger, what it does to your centroid, you know, here's your girder, right? Here's the top flange and bottom flange. You take that bottom flange and you make it larger. Your centroid might have been right here. It drops it down a little bit. Your centroid drops down. What happens to those stresses on the top flange? They're going to get larger, right? Look at where your top flange is. I mean, your top flange is good, but it's close, right? Look at it. It can hold 47.5, and look where it's at. That's close, right? You might not need to change that bottom flange very much. Maybe make it an eighth of an inch thicker or a quarter of an inch thicker, and that's it, you know? But you've got to be careful, right? So we've got, you know, a couple options. Number one is to increase the flange size, okay? But be careful. Be careful, okay? Because you, uh, you could increase the bottom flange size, but you might have to increase the top flange size as well to compensate, okay? That's point one. Now, point two, and, and this is a topic that we're probably not going to discuss this semester, um, you know, in great detail, but you can also incorporate moment redistribution. And that's where you allow the region at the pier to yield a little bit. You can take some of that moment at the pier and shift it back to the positive vending regions. And that's what happened in this example. If you go through and actually go through the document, you find that they actually shifted some of that moment at the pier towards the positive vending regions, and they both ended up working. So I promise you this girder does work. It's just there's some stuff behind the scenes that, that isn't really, you know, clear right now, but maybe we'll talk about it a little bit about it a little bit later. Everybody good so far? Any questions? Ready for a break? All right, let's take a, a, a quick break, maybe meet a little bit before eight. Sound good?